Welcome back to the channel, everyone. Today, I wanted to talk about uh, an interesting paper that has recently come out of Spain, published in the journal Limnetica, called The Crixid Cigara Distincta in the Pyrenees, the first record for Spain in an unsolved taxonomic puzzle. So for those of you who aren't familiar with Crixids, a Crixid is a type of Hemiptera, so a true bug in, a, in, in the Heteroptera. And these are water insects, sometimes referred to as water boatmen, because they use their hind legs, which are up here, as oars to very rapidly swim across either the surface or underwater. And they push and pull them back and forth very, very quickly, uh, and they kind of look like they're rowing a boat when they move around. They're generally very easy to recognize because they are very, very frequently covered with these stripes, these kind of tiger-striped pattern. So they're very easily identifiable, but when you try to identify them past this family level, uh, it can be very difficult. There are multiple species complexes within the family, so many of them can be extremely difficult to identify morphologically. Many of the species are very closely related and they share very, very similar morphologies. So sometimes you have to resort to uh, high microscopy identification. You might have to remove the genitalia, uh, things like that. One of the other interesting things that you can do is uh, study the what is called the pala, which are, which are the four tarsi, which are modified for swimming, but also for uh, dietary reasons. So this group is or this group tends to be omnivorous. Some of the species feed on uh, other animals, and a lot of the species will just feed off of algae and things like that. So some of the predaceous group tend to have modified tarsi for uh, attacking. So they'll have like claws, whereas vegetarians amongst them will have these little scoops, like little spoons for hands. So anyway, going back to this paper, uh, these corixids were collected in the Spanish Pyrenees, which is as far south as this group Sagarda Distincta has ever been found, or at least been confirmed to be. Here is the location on Google Maps. Uh, you have on the south side of this line, this is Spain, north is France, and then you have Andorra here to the east. If we zoom in, this isn't much of a lake. It's called Lake Villic, but it's really a pond. And this is what that pond looks like. So it's not very large, uh, a very, very small pond uh, up in the mountains, so at a fairly high altitude, it's fairly shallow. You can see that there is a lot of kind of stagnant growth of plant matter, which is what these little crixids feed on. And what is interesting, other than that this is as far south as they've ever been confirmed, this is also at a fairly high altitude for this species. So going back to this paper, this group is part of a species complex with uh, other Sigarda species, Sigarda distincta, Sigarda phaleni, Sigarda Iacatans and Sagarda fossarum are all very, very closely related and very, very difficult to distinguish. And a lot of these species fall into this uh, sub Sagarda subgenus. And for those of you not familiar, you might, you might be thinking, well, what is a subgenus? I've never heard of that before. When you are talking about the hierarchy of taxonomic categories, there is a lot of gray area that we generally don't talk about when you're teaching something like, you know, intro to biology at a college level or something like that. There are layers in between these layers. So between family here, you might have something like uh, subfamily and uh, tribe. And when you get into this very fine level where we generally talk about new species being found with genus and species, you still have these gray areas where you have something like a subgenus where maybe these species in the subgenus could theoretically be considered maybe their own genus. And it's the same when you're talking about at the species level, maybe you have subspecies or uh, sometimes we'll talk about variants or races or strains, depending on what the group is. And maybe these things should be considered their own species. There's a lot of gray area. How different do specimens have to be to be considered different species? When do you decide that actually it's different enough to be considered a, its own separate species. Many of you may be familiar with something like the biological species concept, where if you have two animals that can hybridize and produce viable offspring, they should be considered the same species. But in reality, that's not really how we talk about species in biology. There's a lot of different species concepts. Uh, sometimes it's based on genetics, sometimes it's based on morphology, sometimes it's based on behavior. And so a lot of the times there's this big gray area and it's kind of just up to whoever the researcher working on this group is to propose whether or not they think it should be a new species and then defend that. 
So what is happening with this research, research paper is that they are working on the subgenus Subsigarda, specifically Sigarda distincta, and they find it in a very strange location. And these specimens are very difficult to identify, so they do use a genetic uh, barcoding method in order to determine the species, primarily because a lot of the specimens that they're collecting are immature, which are generally impossible to identify to species level. This is your Sigarda distincta, Along with some of their morphological characteristics, you have the right paramere of males, and you have the pala, this is that scoop that they used to feed. And what they ha found after they did their genetic barcoding is very interesting. So this figure represents the relationship uh, amongst the specimens within the sub group. You have Sigarda distincta up here. These are the uh, ones that they were working on, these ones with the asterisk here. These are the ones that they collected, sub or Sigarda distincta from the Pyrenees, and related specimens. So, or you have other things within the group. You have Sigarda phalanoides, Sigarda phaleni, and then all these other Sigarda distinctas that were collected in Northern Europe. So Sigarda distincta is very common across Northern Europe, as well as parts of Northern Asia. I think all the way over to Mongolia. So it's a very, very common species. And they found two distinct groups. And the ones that they were collecting in the Pyrenees were actually most closely related to a very rare uh, haplotype, which was collected in Germany, in northern Germany. So now you have this bizarre situation where this there seems to be a subspecies, perhaps, of this Sigarda distincta from northern Germany, which is also living in the Pyrenees Mountains, the Spanish Pyrenees. How it got there, no one knows, but they are very uh, genetically distinct from all of their other Sigarda distinctive cousins within Europe, even within Germany and uh, parts of France where you can actually found, find the species. How did this uh, German haplogroup make it to the Pyrenees? Why are they so genetically distinct from their cousins? It seems that this population in uh, Spain that is related to this German population is very genetically distinct. There must be some sort of genetic flow there. And it's not like, as far as they can tell, there is a gradation in genetic relationship between uh, these distincta, uh, these Sigarda distincta in Spain and Germany and the other European Sigarda distincta. So it's possible that you have a subspecies here. It's possible that these are actually distinct species that they haven't been able to tell apart this whole time that you have some sort of cryptic species situation going on here. And why I bring this up, why it's interesting is one, I like crixids, but two, it's important to remember that there are more species out there than you realize. And a lot of the things which uh, we think are one species are frequently a lot of species that we just haven't been able to figure out how to tell them apart yet. The more you dive into this water, the deeper it seems to get. Uh, the more you look at these groups, the more species there seems to be in them. And it becomes very, very hard to draw the line between where one species ends and where another begins. This paper is very short. I'll link it in the description. But I just thought maybe you'd like to know what was going on. Uh, this is kind of the nitty gritty uh, in of entomological research where you're talking about uh, collecting individual bugs and trying to figure out what it is that you're dealing with. And I'll, so I'll talk to you guys later.